Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to be teaching a series. Uh, all of these will build upon each other. And um, let me just say up front that I'm going to be saying some things that I guarantee you is going to challenge every person in here. These first few verses that I read, if you really understood what they say, I guarantee you, it would just challenge to the core every one of our beliefs. And yet this is from the Bible. And yet here's what I've discovered. Dealing with myself and with other people. That you know what? Most people do not let the Bible get in the way of what they believe very much. Most people believe things because this is what they have been taught either directly or by example or they've just assimilated it and they don't really know what the Word says. And when they read something, they let the traditions and doctrines of men basically void the Word of God. This is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7 verse 13. He says, but your traditions and doctrines of men have made the Word of none effect. And so I'm going to read some verses right here out of Hebrews chapter 10 that at first glance may not mean much to you, but we're going to go back and just take these and break this down over these five sessions. And basically what we're going to do is do a study on the book of Hebrews. And, but as I've been studying this, about the last month or two months, I've been reading through Hebrews, and I got stuck here in Hebrews chapter 10 at these verses, just overwhelmed with what they said. And I've been meditating on it, and for well over a month, I'm sure, this is about the only verses that I've studied and just gone back, and it's just really impacted my life. And everything that the book of Hebrews is saying, basically, is capsulated right here in Hebrews chapter 10, just a few verses. So we're going to read those, and then we're going to spend the rest of this week going back and breaking down and explaining this. And uh, we'll go back to a lot of different scriptures, and basically what this will do is give us a summary of what the book of Hebrews is about. If Hebrews and Romans aren't probably your two favorite books in the Bible, or at least up there in the top ten, you do not understand the gospel. These are tremendous books. And the book of Hebrews was written specifically to help people who had been under a legalistic approach towards God to transition from that into the new covenant. The old covenant was a legalistic approach based on your performance and on how well you lived. And there is a difference between the way that people approach God under the Old Covenant and the way people approach God under the New Covenant. And the book of Hebrews is written specifically to contrast this and to show you how to approach God through a new and living way. And the sad fact is most Christians have never made this transition. The vast majority of Christianity, and I... You know, I don't have any inspired thing on this, but it's just my personal opinion that I'm saying over 90% of all Christians and all Christian ministry is still based on the old covenant way of approaching God. And they think, but they're, you know, God is the same. It's, it's all the same. And they try and merge the new and the old together. And that can't be done. Matter of fact, I won't take time to turn back over there, but when Jesus gave the parable about you can't put new wine into an old wine skins or the bottles will burst and the wine will run out, he was talking about the Old Testament law because people were challenging him. You aren't doing things according to what uh, the Scriptures say about the Sabbath. And his response was, you can't put new wine into an old wine skin. You have to put new wine into a new wine skin. There was a brand new way. That's the reason we call it the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, they aren't the same. There's more of a difference than just one blank page in your Bible. It is a total different approach towards God. And yet most people have never made the transition. And then there's a lot of people that are just totally approaching God as if there wasn't a New Covenant. And then there's a lot of people that are trying to mix the two. And they don't mix. It's impossible. There has to be a clean break. And this is the reason that the book of Hebrews and the book of Romans was written to help us in this area. And yet most Christians 
uh, haven't made the transition. And so I'm going to be reading some scriptures. I just wanted to warn you up front that if you believe this, it's going to totally transform everything. You're going to have to make one or two decisions. If you come to all five of these sessions, you're going to have to make one or two decisions. You're either going to have to change and let the Word of God begin to dominate your life or you'll have to reject what I'm saying and because it doesn't line up with tradition in the way you've been taught. Those are about the only two choices. And somebody says, oh, I don't believe I have any tradition in me. Well, just hang on. I can guarantee you we'll be countering some tradition. Amen. So look in Hebrews chapter 10. To me, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through, I believe it's about verse 23, summarizes the whole book of Hebrews. Matter of fact, he starts off by saying this in Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 19, he says, having therefore, brethren, so the word therefore is linked to the previous statements and and basically the points that he had been making in the book of Hebrews up to this point. And so here is kind of the conclusion. It's like if you were to want to hang a picture on the wall, you have to put a nail in to bear the weight, and then you hang the picture, and it, all, it hangs on that one nail or on that screw that you put in the wall. This is like the nail. This is the point that he's trying to make. And all of these other truths, everything in the book of Hebrews hinges on this and uh, as we go back through this and look at it, I believe we'll be able to basically summarize the points he's trying to make. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us that uh, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You know, those are easy scriptures to read, but we're going to go back and look at this, and as we break this down and look at every single thing that's said in here, I think that you're going to come to a place that we haven't been taking full advantage of what Jesus purchased for us. And this is the reason that we haven't been getting better results. This is going to, I really believe, challenge some things. So let's go back and look at this. Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 19, he says, Having therefore, and again, this is putting it into context, the immediate context of this, chapter 9 and chapter 10, is talking about how that Jesus offered one sacrifice for all sin forever. One sacrifice. Now I'm going to expound on this more either tomorrow morning or tomorrow night. I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to come out. But let me just say this as a tease, and this is going to challenge some of you from the very get-go. Most people don't understand this. Most people think that every time you sin, you have to have that new sin, even after you get born again, put under the blood and confessed, or you lose either your eternal relationship with God or a lesser interpretation, but the same thing is you lose your fellowship with God. And every time that you commit a sin as a Christian, you've got to run back and get that sin under the blood and re atone for. Now, I'm going to go into more detail on this later, so I won't do it tonight. But the scripture in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10, about five or six different times are making the point that the Old Testament had to offer a sacrifice for sin every time you committed a sin. But the reason for it was because they were only types and shadows and pictures of what was coming. And so the type and the shadow had to be constantly kept before the people. So every time you sinned, there had to be a sacrifice. And then one day a year, the Day of Atonement, they offered a sacrifice for everybody's sins just to cover everything in case anything was missed. There was a constant reminder of sin. And did you know that that is still prevalent in the body of Christ today? The average Christian comes to the Lord, believes that they get forgiven of their sin up until the point where they got born again, and then the next time you sin, you've got to go back and reconfess that sin and get it under the blood. 
And if you don't, well then, two interpretations. The extreme legalists believe that every sin that is unconfessed, you go to hell. Even though you could have been a Christian for 20, 40 years, if you have an unconfessed sin in your life, you go to hell. If I believe that, I'd just kill you the moment you got born again because that's the only way you're ever going to make it. You can't keep every single sin confessed. There's sins that we do that are sins of omission, not only things that we've directly violated, but you fail to be everything that you should. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Romans 14, 23. So sin is not only the things you're doing that are wrong, contradictory to a command, but sin is what you should be doing that you're failing to do. Every one of us is failing. And if you had to keep every sin confessed, you might as well hang it up. I'd do you a service to just kill you the moment you get born again because that's the only way you're going to keep it all straight. But see, the Scripture says that God forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even sin that you haven't committed yet. And, and so back up in just a couple of verses here in verse 17. Here's, it's quoting from as, or Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. And the end part of this in verse 17, it says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. This was a prophecy about a New Testament covenant that was going to come into effect. He says, I'm going to void the first covenant, the Old Testament law, and I'm going to establish a new covenant. And here is one of the major planks or contracts in this new covenant and that is that their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And again, if you take it in context, it's not only the sins up until you got born again, but all sin. The Lord just dealt with all sin, past, present, and even future tense sin. Hebrews 10.10 10 says that you were sanctified through the one offering of Jesus once for all. Verse 14 says if you were sanctified, you were also perfected forever. Not until the next time you sin and lose it and then you have to get it back under the blood. You are perfected forever. And because of this, this new covenant says, Your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And verse 18 says, Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. This is radical. Did you know that basically the body of Christ does not understand this? They think, well, no, I believe that I'm saved and I was forgiven of my sins in the past, but I've sinned and I've got to go to the Lord and get that sin under the blood. Or the legalist will believe I've lost my salvation and I'm living in a, a backslidden state and so I've got to go confess it and get born again again, which the Bible never talks about being born again again. You're just born again, period. Or a lesser interpretation is, well, I won't lose my salvation, but I can't, God won't answer my prayer, God won't fellowship with me, I won't have joy, I won't have peace until I get this sin forgiven and under the blood. No, these verses, and I'm going to go into more detail and establish this, show that your sins were all forgiven, past, present, and future, and since they've all been paid for, there's nothing left to pay. Sin, if you've been born again, that's a big if, but if you have been born again, if you have made Jesus your Lord, you become a new creature, sin is no longer an issue between you and God. That's the context. And since Jesus paid for all of your sin, there is nothing left to pay. And what's the result of that? Verse 19, it says, Having therefore, because all of these things I just said are true, it gives you boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Did you know that the word boldness here, of course the word boldness by itself without even going into any further explanation is something that very few Christians have. Most Christians are not bold in their relationship with God. They approach the Lord with fear, not a holy reverence, but rather a fear of punishment and rejection. They fear that they aren't worthy and that they haven't done enough. They fear that they are going to fall short and that God won't bless them. The average Christian does not approach the Lord with boldness. But the scripture says, Proverbs 28.1, it says, The wicked flee when there's no man without, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The way that most people interpret that is, is when I'm living right, when I've not got any sin in my life, when I'm doing everything right, then I can be bold. 
That's not what that's talking about because you can't ever get to a place to where there is no failure or sin in your life. All of us are constantly falling short. And the moment you start embracing this, that I've got to do everything right and then I'm going to have boldness and confidence that God moves in my life. You'll never have boldness or confidence as long as it's based on your goodness. The moment you start trying to earn boldness by your actions, your own conscience is going to condemn you. And this is another thing that I'm going to make a major point of this week. It was down there in the 21st verse, I think, we're, or 23rd verse, where you have to have your heart cleansed from an evil conscience. Our conscience is the part that's defiled, and the Scripture says over in Romans chapter 2 that your conscience either bears witness and gives confidence, or it condemns you. The conscience is the part of you that keeps us from having boldness. And you know why we have a defiled conscience? Because of the law. The law gives us knowledge of sin and takes away confidence. That's the purpose of the law, is to make you condemned. Look down here in the 35th verse of this same chapter. The same word that was translated boldness in verse 19... In verse um, 35, it says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. The same word that was translated boldness in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, was translated confidence in verse 35. So I believe that you could say that boldness is also having confidence. And you know what? There's not a lot of people that have a strong confidence in their relationship. You know, I'm not sure that everybody's embracing what I'm saying here because we've just accepted things and it's so prevalent that we look around and see that everybody's like this and think we're okay. But the scripture, like if you were to go back to chapter 10, verse 2, and again, I'm going to cover this in more detail, so I'll just mention this. I'm setting everything up tonight. Amen. This is really conditional on everything I'm going to say the rest of the week. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, it says that if those sacrifices that, could have been, that were offered year by year could have made the comers thereunto perfect, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged, once purged, once purged means not purged a million times every time you mess up, but once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Now the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't work because they were only types and shadows. But the New Testament sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for us did work so that once purged, here's the way that New Testament Christians should be living. We should have no more sin consciousness. I don't know if you can embrace what I'm saying, but this is rare as hen's teeth. There aren't very many Christians that experience no condemnation and have total freedom from sin consciousness. There's very few people that experience that, and there's even less people that believe that it's even a goal. Most people are actually taught that going around feeling sinful and feeling unworthy and bearing about that, oh God, I've failed you so bad, and being, being, having an unworthy consciousness is actually a positive thing is the way that religion is teaching it. We will sing songs like, you know, such a sorry sinner and we'll sing about how bad we are. Matter of fact, one of the reasons I love Charlie and Jill's praise and worship, and I'm so excited about them being a part of our Bible college to teach people these things, is that, I don't know if you've noticed, but when they sing, they sing about how good God is. They are worshiping God for His goodness and praising Him for what's done. They do not come out with, oh God, we're so sorry, and oh God, I feel so bad today, and God, I believe that you're using these things to teach me something. Most of what's called Christian music today is nothing but griping and complaining in the name of the Lord. It is not edifying and building up. And we've been taught this. We've been taught that it, somehow or another feeling bad about ourselves is good. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> Y'all are looking like, who would ever think that? You know, if I could go home with you 
And if I could watch you and listen to your prayers, I can guarantee you the vast majority of us go about with a sin consciousness, an unworthy consciousness, just constantly feeling like, oh God, we don't deserve anything. Well, by yourself, you don't deserve anything. I'd agree with that. But you aren't by yourself. You got born again. And if you've been born again, you are a brand new creature. And the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. What is worshiping God in spirit? Well, again, religion has twisted this and, and so that we, we say that being in spirit is where, man, you're running and jumping and you're feeling a goose bump and you're going through some form. You know, the liturgical churches will be it's when you're real quiet and still and there's a great choir or something and Pentecostal churches it's all about feeling something and everybody has their own different interpretation worshiping in spirit is talking about that when you got born again your spirit got born again you became a new creature 2 Corinthians 5 17 old things passed away all things became new verse 18 and all things are of God in your spirit, when you got born again, you became a totally, totally brand new creation that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24, 1 John 4.17, you are identical to Jesus in your spirit. And God is a spirit, and God is worshiping. To worship Him, you have to contact Him, relate to Him in spirit and in truth. So when a person is saying, but oh, I'm so unworthy, you either aren't born again, or if you're born again, you're in the flesh and not in the spirit. You aren't worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. You're coming before Him based on what you've been doing and on how holy you've been. And I guarantee you, there's a large number of people right here in this room. And I'm not ragging on you. I believe you're wonderful for being out here on a Thursday night listening to a hick from Texas. I, you are the cream of the crop, amen. And yet, I believe that God didn't lay this on my heart to say to all of the people who didn't come, this is for you, amen. There's a lot of you right here that in your set you are feeling like, but oh God, I haven't been studying. I haven't prayed. I made this promise to you. I f failed in that. I had a fight with my wife on the way to the meeting tonight. I've done this and I've done that. No oh God, how could you love me? You aren't worshiping God in spirit. You're worshiping God in the flesh based on your action. Because if you were born again in your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. 1 John 4, 17, as He is, so are we in this world. That, and that cannot be fulfilled in your actions. That's talking about when you got born again, this part of you that was changed, you are now perfect in your spirit. So to worship God in spirit and in truth isn't talking about some position, whether your hands are folded, whether you're screaming or yelling or jumping or have a goose bump or whether you see a glory cloud. It's talking about are you worshiping Him based on who you are in Christ and what Jesus did or are you trying to approach God on the basis of your own effort and your own goodness? If you are basing it upon what you have done, then you aren't in spirit. You're in the flesh. And you cannot please God in the flesh. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God is what it says in Romans chapter 8. You can't please God on the basis of your own effort. So see, if you understand these things and understand the atonement of the Lord Jesus, then you can have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Not by your blood, not by your works, not by your effort, but based upon what Jesus did for you. And that's the only thing that can ever give you access to God the Father is through the blood of Jesus. And if you try and mix the blood of Jesus with your own blood, that's just another way of saying if you try and mix what Jesus did for you with your, what you do for Him, then you pollute the whole thing. You are polluting and defiling the blood of Jesus any time you come before the Lord on the basis of what you have done and trusting in your own goodness and not trusting in Him. Amen. And it's my opinion that this is where the vast majority of Christians are not connecting with God is because 
They aren't coming based on what Jesus has done for them, but they are come, coming to God based upon what they have done for Jesus. And notice also in this 19th verse, this is a major deal. And we say this so easily, but we don't understand the context of this. Again, this was written to Hebrew Christians, to Jewish Christians who had been raised under the Old Testament law and were familiar with approaching God under the Old Testament system. And to them, this was radical, radical stuff. It says that we have boldness to enter into the holiest. You know what this is referring to? It's referring to the Old Testament tabernacle. And when Moses received these commands from God, he was commanded to build a tabernacle. Let me just go back and read a couple of verses here in, in chapter 8. This is Hebrews chapter 8. And in verse 1 it says, Now of the things which we have spoken up until this point, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, talking about Jesus, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. What this is talking about is that there is a tabernacle or a temple in heaven. Many people haven't made this connection. But Moses didn't create something here on earth that just came into existence. But I'm going to, for time's sake, I'm not going to read all of this. We'll probably come back to these verses. But drop down to verse uh, 5. It says, Who's, all of these things, talking about the elements that are in the tabernacle, they serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, this is a quotation from the Old Testament, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. When Moses was on the mount, God opened up heaven and he saw into heaven and in heaven there is a temple. And it goes on and it says this later, it says that Jesus didn't enter into the physical temple that was on the earth and put his blood on the mercy seat there, but he entered into heaven itself. Let me see if I can uh, find this. In chapter 9 and in verse 24 it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, talking about something physical that men made here on the earth, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. There is a physical temple in heaven. And when Moses was on the mountain, he had the heavens open and he saw the temple. And he built the tabernacle here on earth to resemble the pattern that was shown to him on the mount. So the physical tabernacle was a representation of the true temple that was in heaven. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he did not enter into the temple that was built here on the earth and put his blood there. But he went directly into heaven and entered into the holy place and put his blood there on the mercy seat and made an atonement for us. And so he did the... Uh, all of these things that were here on the earth were patterns of things that were in heaven, but Jesus went into the very temple himself and reconciled us by one offering unto God forever. All sin has been atoned for. So... Here's what this is talking about. In the Old Testament, you know, I've got a, a, a slide here or a picture of this. I'd like them to put this up. This is about the uh, tabernacle for any of you that aren't familiar. And this is just a real simple um, illustration of it. But the uh, shaded area, the largest rectangle there is the outer um, curtains that were set up around the tabernacle. And it was a, it was a huge... Um, area that this enclosed and over there on the on your right hand side where it says Issachar what that is that's the names of the tribes they were commanded to encamp around the tabernacle in this uh, configuration and so over there where it says Issachar that's the eastern side the tabernacle always had to face east the temple when it was built in Jerusalem faced east 
and there was an eastern gate. Jesus entered in through that eastern gate and He said that there would never be anybody else enter in through the eastern gate until He comes. And right after the crucifixion of Jesus, they sealed that eastern gate. If you go to Jerusalem today, the eastern gate is sealed. And they've actually planted a um, graveyard in front of it so that it would never be disturbed. It'll never be opened again until Jesus comes back and enters. And so anyway, there's real significance to this facing east. But you enter over there where it says Issachar. That was the eastern side. And you entered into what was called the outer court. And there was the altar. This is what's called uh, the brazen altar. This is where they offered all of the animal sacrifices. Then there was that circle is the laver. And that's where after you had offered the sacrifices, you had to wash yourself and cleanse yourself before you could enter into what's called the... Uh, well, this was called by a number of different names, but it was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was sometimes referring to the entire enclosure, the outer curtains, but more times than not, it referred to this uh, white area in there that was called the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And the priest could enter into the area after they had offered a sacrifice and after they had gone by the brazen altar, they could enter into this portion called the Holy Place and down there on the bottom side of this is where they had the candlestick. And uh, it had to be kept going constantly. It could never go out. On the top part of that, or as you're walking into there, the right-hand side is where the showbread is. And they always had this showbread that was uh, put out. That place that was right in front of the Holy of Holies was an altar of incense. And it symbolized prayer. And they would come and put incense there, and that went up. And the priest could enter into this area called the holy place. Nobody but the priest could. But the priest could enter into there after they had uh, offered the sacrifice and gone past the labor. They could enter into there, and they had to enter into there every single day to tend the lamp, to offer up the showbread, to burn incense before the Lord. And they worshiped God in this area continually. But then the portion that's called the Holy of Holies in there was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And there were these cherubs that were over the Ark. And these cherubs faced each other. And in the tabernacle like this, the way that God instructed it to be built, the cherub, cherubs were on each side of the Ark of the Covenant and they faced each other and their wings went forward and touched each other. Now, I've got to say some things quickly here. And I know some of you think this is a little technical, but you aren't going to understand what the benefit of entering into the Holy of Holies is if you don't understand some of these things. So use your brain for something besides a hat rack and figure this out. It may not be real entertaining, but it'll help you. Amen. These cherubs faced each other with their wings together in the tabernacle. Now, when Solomon built the temple... He built this thing, and it was uh, 60 foot wide and 30 feet tall. Is that right? Or was it 60 by 60? Anyway, I may not have the dimensions exactly right. But it was about, what, the size of this room or something like this, about this width. It was a huge area, and Solomon built these cherubims so that there was two of them in there, and they stretched out their wings, and one wing tip touched that wall, the other wing tip reached halfway across and touched the wing of the second cherub, and then his far wing reached the other wall. So these two cherubs span the entire width of the Holy of Holies. And you've got to remember that cherubs are the angel that God's uh, put at the east end of the Garden of Eden when he kicked Adam and Eve out, and they had a flaming sword in their hand that turned every way to keep the way of the Tree of Life. Cherubs aren't little fat, naked babies. <laughs> Cherubs are warrior angels. And let me just go back. Man, this really blesses me. I hope you're following this because this will really bless you and it will help you to enter into a new living relationship with God if you can get this. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. And so we've already dealt with those verses. Here's actually the verses I meant to read. This is Hebrews chapter 9. But those were good. There's nothing wrong with reading them. 
Let's look in chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. In other words, they, they pictured divine things that were in heaven and things that re had to do with our relationship directly with God, but they were an earthly sanctuary. They were just physical representations of spiritual things. In verse 2 it says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That's what on this diagram we call the holy uh, place. And it says, And after that the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein were uh, the golden rod that ha I mean the golden pot that had manna. All of these are referring to things that happened in the old covenant. The uh, golden censer is the one that Aaron offered incense on in, Ex in uh, Numbers chapter 16, and it stopped the plague. And they put that in there as a testimony about there was I think 72,000 people killed in this deal and it was put in there to show that Moses and Aaron were the ones anointed and it also had this golden pot that had manna in it that was a testimony to the Israelites of the manna that they ate for 40 years in the wilderness and it was put inside of the Ark of the Covenant and it said um, and Aaron's rod that budded this was a time when the children of Israel cha challenged Aaron's authority and so God said have every leader of every tribe take an, uh, a rod and put it before the uh, tabernacle and they let it go overnight and he said the one that buds will be the one that I've chosen. So now these are all sticks that have been cut off. They're just like a stick that we had. They were all dead and yet they put these 12 sticks in front of God and Aaron's, they each carved their name on it and Aaron's rod budded and produced al almonds overnight. It was a miracle. And once that happened, it quieted all of the opposition because here was a supernatural display that God had chosen Aaron and his tribe to be the priest. And so it shut up all of the complaints. And he says, put this stick into the holy place and leave it there for a reminder for all generations that I've chosen the Isra uh, out of the Israelites, the tribe of Aaron, uh, to be the priest. So that's what he's referring to. And in this holy place, there was the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Those are the Ten Commandments. And in verse 5 it says, And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Well, that is powerful. He listed every single thing in there. And he talked about the candlestick, he talked about the showbread, he talked about the altar of incense, he talked about the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubims. But when he got to the cherubims, he says, we can't speak particularly of them. You know why? In other words, his analogy that he's using right here works for every piece of furniture in the tabernacle except the cherubims. You know why that doesn't work? Because if you go back, the cherubims were there as warrior angels to keep any person from coming into the Holy of Holies. And if you didn't enter, there was only one person that could enter, and that was the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. He had to take and offer a sacrifice, first of all, for himself. And then he offered a sacrifice for the rest of the Israelites, and he had to approach and do it exactly right. And if you didn't, you got killed. As a matter of fact, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu in, in Leviticus chapter 10, didn't follow the proper order and didn't offer things correctly. And Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, were killed. Fire came out of the altar and burned them to a crisp. And it was right after that that the Lord says, See that the priests do not enter into the Holy of Holies at any time. You can only come one time. And I think that... I forget exactly where that's uh, recorded. I could find it. But it was a command, and it was right after... Well, it was in Leviticus chapter 12, because it was chapter 10 where they were killed. And right after that, he told them, he says, you put restrictions. They can only enter one time, and they have to go through all of these rituals. And if you didn't do it just right, you were killed, as Nadab and Abihu were. 
So this isn't in Scripture, but it's in Josephus, who is a first century historian, and he said that this is the way that the priest went in. They actually tied a rope around the foot of the priest. When he went inside that veil and into the Holy of Holies, because if he didn't do everything just right, he could be killed as Nadab and Abihu were, and nobody could go in and get him. So they tied a rope around his leg just in case there was some sin or some failure and if God killed him, they could just drag him out. You know what? You wouldn't have a lot of boldness going in before God if you had a rope around your foot just in case you hadn't done everything right. God was going to kill you. That might have affected the way you approached God. Amen. And so only one time a year on the Day of Atonement in the seventh month could the priest go in and he had to do everything right or he was killed. And so here's my point. That it says that the priest entered in constantly into the holy place to do the service and to keep the uh, candlestick going and to keep the showbread and the altar of incense going. But into the holy of holies, the holiest place, they only entered one time per year with fear and trembling. Now think of all of that. See, that's the picture that's being painted. And now go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. He's saying something here that is so radical to the legalistic Jewish mind that this was just like blasphemy. It was, there's no way that this could be. But he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. This was something that was foreign totally foreign to the Jewish mindset. Nobody had boldness, and there was only one person out of millions that could even approach into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest, and that was only done one time a year with much fear and trembling, and yet here he is saying that we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies, the holiest place by the blood of Jesus. Do you remember that the, uh, in the temple that there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And Josephus, this first century historian, wrote, and you can read all of this over in the book of Exodus, that it was a, a blue curtain and it was woven, it was uh, thick, and it had strands of gold woven all through it, threads of gold. And because of this metal gold that was woven through this thing, it was a solid curtain from one end to the other. And because of that, the thing was so uh, strong that Josephus wrote that a team of horses hooked up to this curtain, pulling in both directions, couldn't split it. And remember that it was like 30 feet high. And yet, I believe it's uh, Matthew chapter 27. Let me look this up. Matthew chapter 27, I believe, is where this is, in verse 51. When Jesus died... In Matthew chapter 27, and let's read verse 50, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. In verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. You know, the significance of the veil being rent Again, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 20, it says we, in verse 19, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 makes it very clear that this veil was symbolic of Jesus. Nobody could enter into the holy of holies without going through Jesus. And until his body was rent and broken for us, there was separation between God and man. That's what the Old Testament tabernacle was, was typifying. This holy place was where God met with the people. There's a number of different times in the Old Testament, like when David was bringing the ark into Jerusalem. It says that, God, I'm bringing the ark of the covenant in where you dwell and where you meet with us. The Ark of the Covenant symbolized the Word of God and God meant with the high priest once a year on that mercy seat 
And this was the presence of God. The way into the presence of God was blocked as long as the veil still existed. Let me go back again to Hebrews chapter 9, I believe it is. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 6, Now when these things were ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, that's talking about the holy place, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made perfect while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The veil was the flesh of Jesus and that veil separated the holy place where the priest could go from the holy of holies where God really dwelled. In other words, they weren't truly in communion with God. There was a separation between God and man which was sin. And until Jesus became sin for us and paid for our sin, that veil separated us and kept us from the presence of God. But when Jesus died, immediately the veil was rent in two from the top to the bottom. The significance of that is that if this curtain was so strong that even a, a team of horses couldn't split it, well then certainly a 30-foot curtain rent from the top to the bottom. How could any person tear this from the top to the bottom. If they could tear it, I guarantee you, they'd have to start at the bottom and work their way up. But it was torn from the top to the bottom, which just signified that this was God that split this, that through Jesus, we now have access, boldness, into the very presence of God without any fear of punishment. Boldness, confidence. Brothers and sisters, this is not what most Christians are living. Most Christians don't have confidence. They come before God into the outer court, but into the very presence of God to where you can literally walk straight up to God on the throne without any fear of punishment, without any fear of being reproved over your sin. I don't know if I'm getting this across to you or not. But you know, if the only thing that Satan's ever had on you is sin, that's the only thing. That's the only thing that takes away confidence is the fact that you know you don't deserve it. You don't doubt God. What you doubt is God's willingness to use His power on your behalf because you know you don't deserve it. You know, you're here on a Thursday night. And this isn't a church night. You aren't getting any points for this. <laughs> you aren't doing your nod to God obligation. If you're here, it's because you're a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic. <laughs> and you know what? You believe in miracles or you wouldn't be here. When I tell you about seeing miracles and seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open, people raised from the dead. My own son was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours. Most of you don't doubt that. That's the reason you're here. You believe in a supernatural God. You are breaking away from just the traditional belief that God exists and you're fanatics. So you don't doubt that God can do it. And if, you know, somebody came forward and if they fell over dead and I said, well, praise God, I've seen people raised from the dead. This will be no different. How many of you believe that God can raise this person from the dead? Boy, most of you would be right in there with me, amen. But you know where I'd lose a vast majority of this crowd is if I say, all right, if you believe it, you come up here and pray. <laughs> now think about this. When I was talking about God can do it and God has the ability and God might even do it for me, most of you would be right in there in agreement. But when I say, you come up here and pray for him, all of a sudden your faith turns to fear. Your enthusiasm 
turns to dread. What changed? What are you doubting? You don't doubt that God can do it. What you're doubting is that He'll do it for you. You know why you have more confidence in my prayers than you have in your prayers? It's because you know you better than you know me. <laughs> if you knew me as well as you know you, you wouldn't have any faith in my prayers either. Amen. <laughs> But see, you know yourself and you know you, you have a sin consciousness that doesn't make you doubt God has the ability, but you doubt that He's willing to use His ability on your behalf because you don't, your conscience isn't giving you boldness, it's instead condemning you and making you feel like you're unworthy. And if you're just talking about who you are in your flesh, you are unworthy. But again, God is a spirit. And if you could worship Him in spirit, based on who you are in Christ, based on the fact that you're a brand new person, if you could come before Him in spirit and in truth, you could have so much boldness that you could enter right into the very throne room of God, right into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus, so that you could obtain mercy. As a matter of fact, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, and it says it in nearly those exact words. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Did you know that the word that was translated boldly right here is the exact same word that was translated boldness in Hebrews 10, 19? Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, not justice, mercy and find grace. You know what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And you know what grace is? Getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting the punishment that you're deserving. And grace is getting all of the goodness of God that you don't deserve. So mercy and grace. You can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And you can have boldness to enter into the very throne room of God, into the Holy of Holies. You know, I hope the things that I've said tonight has painted a picture for you because we sometimes read over these verses, but this was written to help us transition from the Old Testament mindset. Some of you may not have understood everything about the tabernacle. You may not have understood the Holy of Holies and how that there was a... Uh, curtain and the cherubs were there to kill any person who approached God if they weren't perfect and holy because there was only one person that has ever been able to enter into the Holy of Holies based on their own merit and goodness and that's Jesus. And Jesus is now our high priest. The Old Testament high priest was a type and a shadow of Jesus but of course every one of them was sinners so they had to offer sacrifices for themselves and if they didn't do it right like Nadab and Abihu they were killed. But Jesus is the priest that entered in directly into the presence of God. And when he did, he did it through his death and resurrection on the cross. That broke the veil. And now you and I have unlimited access into the very presence of God. According to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2, there should be no more conscience of sin we shouldn't come before the Lord saying, oh God, I'm so sorry of all of this. And, I, and naming every sin real quickly, hoping that if we mention them, God won't. That's the attitude that most Christians have. Instead, we should come in, and if you're a sinner, if you've blown it, if you haven't lived up to something, instead of talking about how sorry you are, talk about how awesome God is to love somebody as sorry as you are. Instead of talking about your failure, talk about the goodness of God that has, ex that has broken the veil and you can now come directly into the very presence of God with no more sin consciousness yeah. through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. That is awesome. If you really understood that, again, I say that the only thing Satan ever had on any of you was your sin. And if you had no sin consciousness... If you had no unworthiness feeling, every person in here believes God is awesome. You believe that God is bigger than the devil, bigger than your sickness, bigger than your failures. You have zero doubt about God. The only doubt you have is that He would ever do it for you. And so that's the reason you have to go to somebody else who you think is holier, closer to God than you are 
You may not express it, but it boils down that you don't have boldness. You don't have confidence. Your own heart is condemning you because you don't understand that the veil has been broken, that there is no longer any restriction. You know, if I was to walk into heaven and if an angel came up to me and says, what makes you worthy? How would you respond? Well... Since I've been preaching on this for nearly an hour, many of you would say the right things right now. But you know what? When you're home by yourself and the devil says, well, you did this and you did that and you haven't been studying it. And you know what? Most of us just cave and immediately say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And, and you don't receive because you don't feel worthy. You haven't entered into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You are still out there in the outer court. The veil is not rent for you. You feel like you have to be worthy. And if you aren't, you're going to be killed or at the very least not receive your blessing, not receive your answer to prayer. And you aren't entering in by the blood of Jesus into the holy place. You aren't acting like a New Testament Christian. You're acting like an Old Testament saint who had to constantly make atonements over and over because they were only types and shadows. They could not never really cleanse you. And so the types and shadows had to be done over and over. But in the new covenant, your one offering has perfected you forever. Hebrews 10, 14. And the veil is gone. And now we have direct access to God. If an angel came up to me and says, you aren't worthy, I could rebuke him in the name of Jesus and command him to get out of my way because nothing can separate me from the love of God. My sin can't separate me from the love of God. And I know that this is a new wrinkle in some of y'all's brains. Because most of us think, oh no, my sin does separate me. Matter of fact, we've got a new commercials coming out that I just saw today on the internet and they're making a commercial where Larry Hodge, who was, I saw him in here a minute ago, he's our director of pastoral relations, he's up there preaching and he's got a diagram that shows repentance leads to heaven, sin leads to hell and he's just preaching hellfire and damnation and he says, now are there any questions? And this woman who works in our TV department, Karen Bean, says, what if a Christian dies with an unconfessed sin? And Larry just goes, you go directly to... And it cuts off and it shows Karen just going... <gasps> and then I come on and say, most people are preaching hellfire and damnation, but God's not mad at you. And I go to preaching the gospel and we say, listen in to the gospel truth, Amen. But you know, that's exactly what most people are used to. They think that if you sin, that man, there's got, sin's got to be judged. I, was, I grew up in this church. I actually spent most of my time in a kind of a mellow Baptist church. But then when I got turned on to the Lord, I went into a fanatical Baptist church that the pa pastor used to jump up on this part of the platform and stand here and bend over and grab the mic like this and scream and yell, and he'd lose anywhere from 5 to 10 pounds every time he preached. Sweat would come out of his shoes. And one of his favorite things was to say, sin's got to be judged. Sin's got to be judged. If you don't confess it and return, repent of it, God's going to punish you. God's going to put you in the hospital. God's going to take something from you. God's going to strike your child dead. You better repent or sin's got to be judged. What he's missing was that sin was judged in the flesh of Jesus. God isn't judging you for your sin. He punished his own son. And he punished his son so much that there is nothing you can do to add to it. Some people think, well, yes, I know that Jesus had to die for my sin, but I've also got to suffer some for it. I couldn't just sin and then waltz right into the presence of God. You just put the veil back. You just made a separation. And you just said that, no, you've got to go back through another sacrifice. No, the veil was rent once from the top to the bottom. It can't be repaired. It was rent once. 
And even though you sin, did you know you can go boldly into the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, not in the time of prosperity when you've done everything perfect. In the time of need when you've messed up, you can still go boldly into the very presence of God. And I know that there's some of you in here that probably all the hair on the back of your neck standing up like fear, like how could you say such a thing? because this is so contrary to religion. But again, this is what Hebrews 10, 19 says. Let us therefore, brethren, have boldness to enter into the holies. If you, are, if you just understood that one verse, we can enter now into the holy of holies. There's no longer a separation. God has removed the veil. Jesus spilt his blood, died, the veil has been split, and the thing that separated man from God was sin. Jesus became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he became sin, who knew no sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't just take a tiny bit of sin. He didn't just taste a little bit of sin. Jesus became sin. And God poured out His wrath on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you and I deserved, God made us, made Jesus suffer that for us. Did you know in the Old Covenant, again, all of these things were types and shadows of New Testament realities. When they brought a lamb to be offered as sacrifice for sin, the priest had to examine the lamb and make sure it was perfect. There couldn't be any blemish. There couldn't be a spot. It had to be a perfect lamb because it typified Jesus. You remember John the Baptist when Jesus came on the scene? He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All of those Old Testament sacrifices were symbolic of Jesus dying for our sins. It says in Isaiah chapter 53, I believe, verse 6, that all we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was as a lamb before his shears is dumb so that Jesus opened not his mouth and he was sacrificed. So Jesus was the lamb. And how did they do it in the Old Testament? When they brought the lamb before the priest, the priest didn't examine the person that brought the lamb. He didn't say, have you been fasting? Have you been praying? Did you study the Word? Have you been treating your wife right? Have you lived holy? Have you gone to synagogue? Have you done everything? They didn't examine the person. They examined the sacrifice. The sacrifice is what had to be holy and pure, not the person offering it. The very fact that you were bringing a sacrifice was an indication that you were unholy. And yet the church today is basically saying, you've got to be holy. I'm saying that holiness had to exist and it was Jesus. Jesus was holy for us and He suffered for us and God is looking at the sacrifice that was made for us and not the person who received the sacrifice. You have been sanctified and perfected through Jesus forever. And the whole mindset that is pointing towards you and unless you get this sin out of your life and until you do this and until you do this, God won't answer your prayer. God won't bless you. God won't use you if you aren't holy. That's silly. If that was true, nobody would be used. God's never had anybody qualified working for Him yet, and I can guarantee you, you aren't going to be the first one. And some people say, well, I'm not perfect, but at least I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do, praise God. I live a certain standard of holy life. You know what? The moment you start saying, well, you got to have a partial holiness or... Is, is the moment you start putting yourself into there, you aren't entering by the blood of Jesus, but you are entering based on your own goodness. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of everything. All of us have missed it. If I miss in the slightest thing, I become guilty of adultery, murder, lying, stealing, 
It's just like the law, it, it was like one huge glass. If I had a huge glass separating you and me, it wouldn't matter if you shoot a bullet through it and make a small hole or if you drive a truck through it and make a big hole. If you break it, the whole thing has to be replaced. God's law may have had 10,000 commands, but there was all one law. And if you broke the slightest one, then you were guilty of all. James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. So those of you who think, well, I, I know that you, you know, none of us can approach God based only on our goodness, but it has to be Jesus plus our goodness. Nope. If you've sinned at all, then you better put your total faith in that lamb that was sacrificed for you and not in yourself. Amen. And brothers and sisters, most of us have been putting our faith in ourselves and that's the reason we don't have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus because we have been self-righteous and it's been encouraged by religion. Look over in 1 John chapter 3. And let me end with this. 1 John chapter 3. In verse 19, it says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Now before I go any further, this is a radical statement. Radical statement. He says this is how we know we are of the truth and can assure our hearts. You know what the word assure is talking about? Give confidence and boldness. Here's a thought that most Christians have never understood. They thought that if I was really in right standing with God, if God was really pleased with me, I would just know it. I would feel His pleasure. I would feel confidence. I would feel boldness. And because we are feeling condemned, most of us take that as an indication that, you know what, God is the one that is making me feel this way. This says that you have to assure your heart. Your heart doesn't naturally just embrace this. You know, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to say this very quickly. I pray that God will give you understanding. I could spend an hour explaining this. But your conscience condemns you that is a product of the fall. And your conscience, even though you're born again, doesn't work for you. It still works against you until you renew it. And this is what Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 says, or verse 14, it says that uh, the blood of Christ will purge our conscience uh, so that we can serve uh, from dead works, so that we can serve a living God. You have to purge your conscience, or as this says, you have to assure your heart. It isn't normal, it's not natural. Once you've sinned, your conscience is just basically condemning you constantly. And I'm going to talk about this more later this week. But you have to assure your heart, you have to purge yourself, as it says in. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us enter in uh, boldly and our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. You have to purge your conscience. It doesn't happen automatically. So this is what this is talking about. We have to assure our hearts before Him, for if our heart condemn us, talking about your conscience, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. What this is saying is that if you feel condemned, once you've been born again, the truth is that the veil is rent in two. God has now got His arms open to you. The cherubims aren't there. God's not going to punish you. He's not going to kill you. He's not mad at you. He's not going to not answer your prayer if you haven't done everything right. Sin has been taken care of. It's a non-issue with God. But if your conscience doesn't know that, if you're still condemning yourself then you won't have boldness to enter in and take advantage of what has been made for us. And so most of us, the way is open, but we aren't receiving the benefit because our own conscience is condemning us. And it says that if our heart does condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. In other words, if you are condemned, it's not because God's condemning you. God knows that the, 
Sacrifice has been made. The veil has been removed. You now have direct access to the very throne of God. God is not mad at you even though you feel that God is mad or displeased. It's not God. And brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. What a lot of people is calling the gospel is not the gospel. But this is the gospel saying that Jesus paid it all. And that you are made holy through what He does, not by your own effort. That's the nearly too good to be true news. There's people standing up in pulpits by the thousands saying, you're going to hell and saying, I'm preaching the gospel. The word gospel means good news. Literally, it means nearly too good to be true news. It's over the top good news. There's nothing nearly too good to be true about telling somebody they're going to hell. We have people going up on the streets and passing out tracts saying, Repent or else, turn or burn. God's angry at you, repent. And they say, man, I'm preaching the gospel. None of that's the gospel. It's true that if a person isn't born again, that sin separates them from God and that that sin, has the atonement for sin, which was Jesus' death, has to be received. And if you don't receive it, you go to hell. Those are all true, but none of that's gospel. None of it's good news. And it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16. It's the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith unto faith, Romans 1, 17. It's the gospel that's going to set people free. Romans 2, 4, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. We're up there preaching, repent or else, turn or burn, trying to scare them out of hell. It's the gospel telling people about how much God loves them, that He died for their sins, not just some of their sins until the next time they blow it, but He died for all of their sins. He wipes sin out. Sin is a non-issue between God and man. If people could understand that, they know in their own heart that they don't deserve it. They would be so impressed with a God who came down and took all of their sins and bore their judgment that they would serve Him more accidentally than they've ever served Him on purpose before, motivated by fear. Fear has torment, but love will cause a person to lay down their life and to do everything. We aren't preaching the, the true gospel, not the same gospel that the Bible preached. And that's the reason that we aren't getting the gospel results.